Hello, my name is Roy Parker. I'm a professor at the University of Arizona and an investigator in the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. In my two talks today, I'll be talking about the life of eukaryotic mRNAs. In my first talk, I discuss the mechanisms by which mRNAs are translated, localized, and degraded in eukaryotic cells. In this talk, I'll be discussing peabodies and what we call the mRNA cycle, and what that tells us about the regulation of eukaryotic mRNAs. This slide here shows a uh, human liver cell in culture, and you can see these bright regions in the cytoplasm, these red dots. And these are what we call uh, peabodies, or cytoplasmic processing bodies. And what we've learned from studying these processing bodies is that they tell us about a dynamic cycle of mRNAs in the cytoplasm which affects their function. And that cycle is cartooned in this slide and has the following key uh, properties. First, mRNAs can exist in a translating state where they're associated with ribosomes making proteins. But under certain conditions, they can exit that state, uh, lose their translation factors in ribosomes, and assemble what we call a peabody mRNP, which is a translationally repressed mRNP, uh, which can aggregate into these larger peabodies. mRNAs within peabodies can either be destroyed or they can return to translation by assembly of a new translation initiation complex and then recruitment of ribosomes. Now, there are three features of this cycle in peabodies that I find particularly interesting uh, and worthy of study. First, the transitions between these different states in the cell are highly likely to play important roles in the regulation of translation, degradation, and perhaps even localization of RNAs within the cell. Obviously, if RNAs are associated with ribosomes and translation factors, they can make proteins. But when they're assembled in translation repression complexes with, uh, and associated with RNA degradative complexes, they're more likely to be targeted for destruction. More, we also think that this might play some role in localization because these components in these peabody structures actually so, show similarity to RNA transport granules in a variety of different cases. So this cycle probably plays a significant role in just the regulation of translation, degradation, and localization of cell, RNAs in cells. A second interesting feature of this uh, cycle is that peabodies, a key uh, component of this cycle, show uh, overlap with other RNA protein granules that are very important in biology. For example, uh, maternal RNA granules, or germinal granules, are complexes of maternal mRNAs and proteins found in the oocytes or embryos of a wide variety of species. And those maternal RNAs are made by the mother, and then during the development of that embryo are translated in specific places and at specific times in order to direct the development of that early embryo. And so the storage and subsequent translation at the right time and place is extremely important. And those granules share many components with peabodies, which are found in every somatic cell that's been examined so far, from yeast to humans. Similarly, neuronal granules, which play important roles in synaptic plasticity and transport RNAs out to uh, various synapses, uh, also share components uh, with peabodies and also share components with germinal granules. So all three of these types of RNA granules are related and probably have an underlying similar biochemical and compositional uh, function. Finally, the third reason that uh, I find these interesting are connections between viruses in the mRNA cycle. So in several cases, uh, components of peabodies or stress granules, another granule in this cycle we'll talk about, are required for viral life cycles. Uh, for example, components of peabodies are required for uh, re retrotransposon, which are retroviral-like elements in yeast. And components of stress granules, such as a protein called DDX3, is required for translation of uh, HIV genomic RNAs, as well as for hepatitis C viral uh, uh, life cycles. And we think these genetic uh, roles are actually important because uh, in some cases the viral complexes or host antiviral factors accumulate in these structures. So for example, what we're looking at here, these are yeast cells, and the, the green are actually markers of peabodies, and the red here are actually showing uh, newly assembled uh, viral particles for this retrotransposon uh, TY3. And you can see, while they don't overlap completely, uh, these viral particles tend to be found uh, in conjunction with partial overlap with uh, peabodies. 
So my lab has then been interested in trying to understand uh, what the properties and function of P bodies are and how it relates to this dynamic transitions that RNAs can undergo uh, in regulating their translation uh, and degradation. Now, uh, work from a wide variety of labs has identified many of the components in P bodies, although we still do not understand the entire complex that's present in these uh, particles. So in, uh, from yeast to mammals, there's a core set of proteins, which include uh, decapping uh, enzyme, as I talked about in my other talk. Uh, it plays a role in degrading RNAs by decapping, as well as various proteins, which either can repress translation or promote decapping, as well as an exonuclease, uh, which degrades the RNA following decapping. In some metazoan cells, uh, microRNA uh, components can also be present in peabodies, or in a related structure, uh, referred to as a GW uh, body, which is similar uh, to peabodies uh, and can show some overlap. Now, peabodies are proportional to the pool of untranslating RNAs, and I just want to illustrate this showing the dynamics of these structures. So these are, this is looking at yeast cells during mid-log growth, and you can see there's a few peabodies of moderate size uh, in those cells. However, if we starve those cells for glucose, this leads to a rapid loss of translation, and you can see that the peabodies get quite a bit larger. Okay. Conversely, if we treat cells with cyclohexamide, which traps mRNAs in polysomes, that is in association with ribosomes, the peabodies disappear. And this type of, these types of observations are uh, some of the data which has led to the model that uh, RNAs partition between translation or peabodies depending upon whether they're associated uh, with ribosomes or with these components of these uh, peabody structures. Peabodies also contain RNA, and we can detect that either by in situ hybridization or by a common technique which is using the ability to tether GFP to a specific RNA through sequence specific RNA binding proteins, essentially making a GFP tagged RNA molecule. And if you do that and then express that in cells which are happily growing here, the RNA tends to be distributed around the cytoplasm uh, because it's engaged in translation. And we can see that because this is a, what's called a polysome trace where the larger these series of peaks here, these are mRNAs associated with ribosomes, the larger this peak is here, the more translation is going on in the cell. Now, if we starve that cell for a few minutes with glucose, you can see that translation declines dramatically. These polysomes are now all gone. And now you can see these mRNAs accumulate in these discrete uh, foci within the cell, and those foci overlap with markers of peabody. So peabodies contain RNAs. And those RNAs can actually uh, re ir reversibly leave peabodies and reenter translation through a number of different experiments uh, shown by uh, Muriel Menguiz and Daniela Texiera in my lab several years ago. And you can see that if you add glucose back, these peabodies shrink back down and the uh, polysomes uh, are restored. Peabodies not only uh, contain RNA, but they also require RNA formation. And here's an experiment done by uh, Marco Valencia Antonio Sanchez in my lab a few years ago, where he purified peabodies by differential centrifugation. And then if he treated those peabodies with RNAs, you could see that they uh, fell apart. And so peabodies not only, uh, uh, so peabodies are complexes then that form on non-translating mRNAs that contain this discrete set of proteins uh, and that they require that RNA for their formation. So one of the questions my lab has been interested in is in trying to understand how do these proteins actually assemble uh, onto the RNA, how do they assemble into a higher order peabody, and what does that tell us about the function of these complexes? And so one approach we've been taking to this is to actually purify all these different components uh, and then test for their interactions between them. And uh, we've done a number of different experiments where we purify uh, the common versions of these core components uh, and then test their binding in vitro. For example, here we're taking two different proteins, we mix them, we purify um, uh, this DHH1 protein back out, and we ask if this one comes along. And if you do a lot of these kinds of co precipitation experiments, uh, what you can uh, see is there's a tremendous number of interactions between these core peabody components uh, with each other and uh, with the RNA molecule. So in this, this is a, a cartoon of showing all of these uh, components using purified uh, proteins, showing the direct protein-protein interactions that occur uh, between these different uh, core components of peabodies. And you can see there's a, a dense network of interactions. And within that, many of these proteins are also RNA binding proteins, and so that these proteins can not only assemble each other, they can also then bind to the RNA molecule uh, to make an RNA protein complex.
Now, we don't really know how those come together to form uh, the definitive complex yet. Uh, one of, that's one of our goals over the next few years. But we currently have two uh, models for what this uh, structure looks like. Uh, one is what we call the closed loop, where the five prime and three prime ends of the RNA are brought together by protein-protein interactions uh, with these different core components being preferentially bound to the cap or the three prime end of the mRNA. And this kind of closed loop model is analogous to models for translation complexes, where the cap and poly A tail are brought together by protein protein interactions of initiation factors bound to those two, factor, two sites uh, to promote uh, the loading of ribosomes. The other possible model is what we call a nucleosome like, where more beads on a string, where we have this core complex and it's found in multiple places on the RNA. Uh, and so that the coding region will be coded as well uh, with these different proteins. And, uh, current experiments in my lab are directed at trying to identify the differences to determine the, what, which of these uh, complexes actually uh, what forms on the RNA. Now, we understand how these RNAs come together into higher order structures from our analysis of these uh, interactions between these proteins. So there are uh, these Peabody mRNPs then come together to form a larger structure through two self-interaction domains. So one of these interaction domains is on the EDC3 protein, so which can actually dimerize between itself. And so if you disrupt that interaction, what you can see is that you lose uh, the number of Peabody's goes down dramatically, although you can still form a few. So this would be a wild-type cell where we've starved it to make really big Peabody's. And now we're going to remove that EDC3 protein. You can see there's still some form. But the ones that form are dependent upon another interaction, which is in the LSM4 protein, which has a C-terminal tail contains what's called a prion domain, okay? And a prion domain is analogous to what we think about in mad cow disease or human kuru disease. That is a self-assembly domain, which at least in disease states can be irreversible. But it's also, this is an example where these types of prion domains not only form a uh, uh, aggregate, but that's actually a reversible assembly, so it's not a pathogenic state. And if you get rid of both the EDC3 protein and this prion domain on the LSM4 protein down here, you see that there's no Peabody's uh, forming anymore. Now, uh, is that interesting that there's actually this prion domain, or what's called, often called a QN domain, involved in aggregation of these uh, RNA protein complexes? And I just want to make a few points about this because I think it's actually a very interesting aspect of the biology, which might have broader significance. First, many proteins involved in translation and RNA degradation have these types of QN domains. For example, if you uh, search the yeast genome, there are about 100 proteins that have the potential to uh, form these types of aggregates through QN or prion domains. Of those 100, 50 are involved in translation or RNA degradation, so over half. And many others, we don't know what they do, so they might also be involved. So I think this is going to be a common feature of many of these proteins uh, in RNA uh, translation and degradation and suggests that they may uh, then have a tendency to form these types of aggregates for biological reasons we don't understand yet. Consistent with that, you know, different types of these domains may create different uh, types of structures or different types of Peabody's, for example. And uh, it's not well understood. Um, how specific these different QN domains can be, but in some cases it appears that they can uh, uh, have specific interactions with each other, and in other cases general. So what that means is different types of QN domains then could also drive different types of domains or types of RNA protein granules. And consistent with that, we also know that QN domains are involved in the assembly of another uh, RNA protein granule in, in yeast and in human cells called a stress granule, which I'll discuss in a few minutes. Finally. The fact that QN domains uh, can be irreversible allows them to function as epigenetic elements. And what that means then is that if you assemble RNA protein granules through these uh, prion domains, uh, you have the potential then to have a heritable uh, genetic state because of that. And so, uh, in fact, uh, a model from Kazakh Sai and Eric Kandel has proposed that such types of prion-driven assembly may play a role in synaptic plasticity uh, in memory formation. Uh, and then finally, uh, it's striking that uh, several of the neurodegenerative diseases uh, involve uh, the expansion of polyglutamine tracts 
in proteins which are normally components of PVISE or stress granules. So for example, Huntington's, the, the protein uh, which uh, uh, gives rise to that neurodegenerative disease, has a poly Q track um, in it, and it's normally a component of PVISE. And it's probably, that's probably why it has the poly Q track, because uh, part of its biology requires it to assemble into that complex. Um, but when that track expands too big, it leads to the uh, formation of cytoplasmic aggregates, and it's controversial whether those are toxic or protective, um, but there's a striking correlation between some of these neurodegenerative diseases having expansions of these uh, tracts and the formation of these aggregates, which are probably related in some manner to uh, the component, to Peabody's um, and or stress granules. All right. So, so we understand somewhat then how these uh, Peabody's uh, assemble, uh, and we understand how they aggregate into larger structures. So this allows us to do an experiment then to test what's the significance of making these larger structures. Uh, is this larger structure important for these RNAs to stop translation, or is it important for them to be degraded? So the experiment we've done then is to simply look at what happens uh, to RNA degradation in a mutant that can no longer assemble these larger structures. And what we observe then, uh, if we look at degradation of RNAs, is that RNAs tend to degrade pretty normally. So here we're looking at uh, specific reporter mRNA, MFA2. We block transcription at zero time, and you can see that in wild type cells, the RNA degrades with a half life of about three minutes. And in the, the mutant, which can't make large P bodies, we assimilate, see a similar decay rate. So, in other words, the formation of these larger scale structures is not required, at least for the degradation of a few reporter mRNAs. And so that suggests that the formation of these individual mRNPs, at least under the conditions that we've examined so far, is sufficient for allowing RNAs to be degraded and for uh, allowing them to exit translation and to enter this translationally repressed state. So this raises a question then, you know, why do cells uh, make these larger structures? And in fact, one has to anticipate that these structures have roles because they're conserved throughout eukaryotic cells that have been looked at. So, so why make these larger structures? And so the simplest explanation is that you make these larger structures to promote interactions between components when those components are limiting. And it's very likely that under the conditions we've examined so far in the lab, uh, the components that we're testing, the, the, under the conditions that we're examining in the lab, uh, the key components that trigger RNA degradation or translational repression are not limiting. Alternatively, it could be that some mRNAs require aggregation for their regulation. It could be that you aggregate to protect against, you, to limit other interactions. For example, aggregation of RNAs into these structures might uh, protect them from other nucleases which are not uh, um, present in those. And then it could be that aggregation plays a role, important roles in organ, cellular organization and or transport. Uh, as we've suggested perhaps in neurons or in uh, uh, germ cells. But this is actually a, uh, an ongoing area of interest, trying to understand the larger role of assembly of these large structures in eukaryotic cells. And I want to point out that this is not a problem that's limited to the study of P bodies and the regulation of translation in the cytoplasm. In fact, that uh, as we study more about the organization of cells, what we've learned is that there's a diversity of RNA protein granules that form uh, in eukaryotic cells. And so in the cytoplasm, we've talked about Peabody's and a little bit about stress granules. But in the nucleus, there are lots of other um, RNA protein complexes, nuclear speckles, which contain splicing uh, factors, um, and also Cajal bodies, which contain components of SNRNA, S small nuclear RNA protein uh, complexes. And actually, the work of Carla Neuberger has really shown that the function of these Cajal bodies is to increase the rate of uh, the assembly of these protein RNA complexes. And so I think one thing we should expect as we go forward is that we're going to, uh, as we study these different RNA protein complexes, is that their general role might be to increase the assembly rates of uh, components within them simply by increasing the high, uh, providing a higher local concentration of those uh, factors. Now, Peabody's often dock or overlap with these uh, RNA granules called, referred to as stress granules. So here we're looking at a mammalian cell 
Uh, the blue represents a stress granule structure, and the uh, yellow or red here represents a peabody. And you can see they're often docked together near each other. A similar phenomenon occurs in yeast, uh, although in that case, in many cases, the uh, peabody and stress granule actually overlap. So here in this particular image of yeast, a peabodies would be red uh, and stress granules would be green. And so if they're overlapped, you'll be yellow. And you can see that many of these components are, in fact, uh, yellow. So what are stress granules? So stress granules, again, are an RNA protein complex containing untranslating RNAs. But in contrast to the decay and translation repressors present in peabodies, stress granules contain translation initiation factors, RNA binding proteins, and in some cases can contain the uh, 40S uh, subunit. Um, stress granules form when translation initiation is slow. And so the simplest model is that uh, these stress granules represent a population of mRNAs which are entering or exiting translation. And that is that they've assembled kind of a translation initiation complex, but they haven't uh, entered the elongation phase of ribosome uh, of translation. It's not known whether they're really exiting or entering translation, uh, although in some cases I'm going to argue they're perhaps uh, entering translation. Now, these interactions between peabodies and stress granules have led to the suggestion that mRNA is exchanged between these two. And so the logic here has been, well, these two different granules interact. Uh, they can contain the same mRNA. And we know that mRNAs which are in peabodies can return to translation. So at some level, those mRNAs must be able to reassociate with translation initiation factors. And so one hypothesis then has been that mRNAs are exchanging between stress granules and peabodies. And there's really two models for how this could be occurring. So in the first model, uh, uh, mRNAs, um, when they're engaged in translation, when they cease translation, they assemble into this stress granule structure. And then within this stress granule, uh, different mRNAs would assemble different complexes. Some RNAs would be targeted for degradation and would be sent to a peabody for destruction, and other RNAs would reassemble a new translation complex and would return to polysomes. The other possibility is, in fact, that um, RNAs, when they exit translation, they travel to a peabody, and that within that peabody, some RNAs would be sorted uh, for destruction, or other RNAs, uh, presumably due to their composition or sequence features, would be reassemble a new translation complex and then would return back to the translating pool. A few years ago, uh, Ross Buckin and my lab wanted to try to distinguish between these two models. And so it's relatively a simple experiment because he's going to analyze how defects in the ability to assemble peabodies or stress granules affect the other structures. So for example, in this model, you would have to assemble a stress granule in order to make a peabody, whereas in this model, you might have to make a peabody in order to make a stress granule. And so here's what those kinds of experiments look like. Here we're using yeast cells where we've got mutations which can prevent the formation of either stress granules or peabodies. And this is a wild type cell. And again, you can see lots of stress granules in green, uh, many peabodies in red. And they're generally overlapping with stress granule markers, so they're yellow. If you get rid of the ability to form stress granules, you still make peabodies, and you make about the same number and the same brightness and the same size uh, of, of peabodies. So mutations reducing stress granules do not affect the formation of peabodies, at least in yeast cells. However, if we do the converse experiment where we get rid of peabodies, now here we're using those mutations I talked about earlier, the EDC3 uh, protein gone and deleting the prion domain on this LSM4 protein, now what you see is that we don't make any peabodies, but we also don't make any stress granules. Okay. So our interpretation of that is, in fact, that stress granules form from pre-existing peabodies. Now, of course, there's two possible views of this. Uh, one view is, in fact, that this effect is really an indirect effect, that if you get rid of peabodies, you have all kinds of changes in the regulation of mRNAs, and that changes the proteins which affect stress granule formation. And therefore, you can't make stress granules for some indirect reason. And the other model is that they're, in fact, that peabodies provide an assembly site, where um, in this model, uh, when RNAs stop translating, they first assemble into these components, complexes that aggregate into peabodies. And that with time, some of these RNAs uh, 
are targeted for translation, so they assemble new translation factors on them, and some are targeted for degradation, and they might go away. And so at this intermediate time, you kind of have an overlap, and then with more time, uh, uh, these RNAs that are being destroyed are gone, and these RNAs, uh, which are going to re-enter translation, will become a greater proponent of the uh, total pool. So in order to look at this, uh, distinguish these possibilities, Ross did an experiment where he basically uh, looked and see if stress granules uh, formed by maturation of peabodies. And so what he's going to do is just follow a time course of the formation of peabodies and stress granules uh, during a glucose deprivation. So he's going to grow a culture, he's going to starve it for glucose for a short period of time, and then watch or take images over a variety of time and see what happens to peabodies and stress granules. And so when he does that experiment, uh, these are the results. And the important observations um, I'm just going to highlight. The first is that the first thing you see is that peabodies get very big. So um, from zero t time here, this is before the stress. There's some small peabodies you can't see under these kind of exposure conditions. But by seven minutes of stress, they're quite large uh, and very bright. So peabodies form first. The second thing you see is that the first stress granules you can see, there's a few of them here at this uh, seven minute time point, they're always in association with a peabody. And so if you look down here in the merge, they always overlap. Okay? So stress granules first appear in conjunction with a peabody. And then the third thing you see is that if you follow with more time, some of these peabodies mature from being a peabody to being primarily like a stress granule. So if you look at this one here, at the early time point, it's prim primarily a peabody with very little stress granule marker. And then by half an hour later, the amount of um, DCP2, a peabody marker there, has declined dramatically, and the amount of poly binding protein, a stress granule marker, has increased, suggesting that these, in fact, uh, are maturing from a peabody state into a stress granule state. Okay? And so that suggests that there's really a directionality in the movement of RNAs uh, between these different types of complexes, that they go from translation uh, to a repressed state, generally in formation with a peabody uh, type of uh, complex, and that those RNAs can then re-enter translation by forming a new translation complex, which is a, can associate into these larger structures referred to as stress granules, and go back into uh, the translation. And although I'm focusing on these individual RNA protein complexes, we can observe that in the microscope really as a summation of that total population as in these aggregates that are visible um, in the light microscope. Now, so what then are stress granules? So at least under these kinds of conditions, this suggests that stress granules are primarily RNAs which are being primed for re-entering translation. Okay? And that then maybe stress granules should be thought of as sites of assembly of translation initiation complexes. And the argument here for this is that they form when initiation is limiting, they form from non-translating RNAs, and they contain translation factors. And so maybe they're not necessarily sites where RNAs are targeted for repression, but they're sites where RNAs uh, have their uh, high local concentration of translation factors and therefore allow for the efficient assembly of these translation initiation complexes, which can then go on and enter translation. And this is an area of uh, further research in my lab as well as other labs as well. Now, I want to step back and just say a few words about RNA granules, because those of you who work in this area uh, or who read about it, uh, it's easy to become confused by the diversity of different types of RNA granules which are described in the literature. And so what I'd like to argue is, in fact, that maybe these granules are all related in a simple kind of model where there are different stages of uh, movements of RNAs through this, different MR, through this mRNA cycle. Right? Now, um, so for example, under some conditions, you can see granules that accumulate, which contain EIF4E, 4G, the cap binding complex, and poly-A binding protein, but are missing other components uh, like 4DS subunits, which form under a different stress. And so uh, a simple way of thinking about these is that they're simply blocked, they have simply different rate-limiting steps in the transitions between these uh, different pools in the mRNA cycle. So if you block this step here in response to a various uh, cue, uh, 
these RNAs accumulate with these complexes, and you'll get a stress granule of that composition. Whereas if you block over here, you'll accumulate with this type of RNA protein complex, and you'll get a stress granule which contains these other factors. Okay? So uh, these aren't fundamentally different particles, perhaps. They're simply different stall points on a continuum of exchange points. And so when one thinks about that kind of model then, the diversity and the composition of granules observed in the cell can also be observed, affected by the behavior of different mRNA subpopulations. For, so for example, when we, uh, uh, under some stresses, you get both P-bodies increasing and stress granules. Well, that's probably because there's uh, some mRNAs which are stalled at this stage, and they're assembled with these P-body components, so you see a large uh, formation of P-bodies. But other mRNAs are stalled at a different site, perhaps over here uh, after they have the small subunit, and so you'll also see stress granules accumulating. And so one of the things we don't understand very well is what's the diversity of different types of mRNAs and mRNA protein complexes, and then how they lead to these different um, uh, accumulations of different particles uh, under different uh, conditions. But one thing consistent with this is that if we go and look in the literature, what we can see is that there's really a continuum of RNA protein granules, which span from a uh, classical P-body, as defined in the initial papers, to a classical stress granule. And so this is just a, a cartoon of that. And the important thing to look at here is uh, underneath each of these uh, particles is shown a list of the proteins found in them. And green would be components which are only seen in P-bodies. So this would be a P-body which has only components of P-bodies. Yellow are proteins which can be seen in either P-bodies or stress granules. And red would be components which are only seen in stress granules. And if you look around uh, literature, dendritic uh, P-bodies, these are RNA protein complexes found um, at the dendritic side of synapses in various neurons. They have a mixture of both P-body and stress granule components. Um, transport uh, particles in neurons in Drosophila have a mixture again. Um, uh, in C. elegans, different types of granules can again have a mixture. And if you, uh, although in many cases we don't know the complete composition of each of these granules, what you begin to see is that there's no such thing as there are two boundary conditions, but then there's a wide, wide range of uh, different intermediate forms. And that we, sh we should um, perhaps think of these then all as different stall points on this mRNA cycle or different subpopulations of mRNAs stalled at a mixture of sites. All right. So in summary then, I just want to uh, try to highlight the main points of what I've tried to say is that uh, in cells, uh, mRNAs can exist in at least two predominant mRNP states, those that are translating and those that are repressed. And those repressed mRNAs typically accumulate in uh, RNA protein granules, such as P-bodies uh, and stress granules. That these different uh, biochemical compartments can have different rates of translation, deadenylation, and mRNA degradation, uh, depending upon where the mRNA is in the cell and what proteins it's associated with. P-bodies may also be related to RNA transport uh, particles and therefore play some role in localization. And that there are mechanisms which move RNAs between these compartments, which I haven't had time to talk about today, uh, which are discrete and involve uh, various types of uh, proteins and enzymes. There's lots of uh, unanswered questions in this area. You know, how do mRNAs actually cease translation, assemble into P-bodies? How do mRNAs get out of P-bodies and reassemble a new translation complex? and get back into the translating pool. How do you determine which mRNAs are going to do which? And why do you actually form these large-scale aggregates? The prediction is to promote interactions between limiting components, but there's no direct uh, demonstration of that uh, for P-bodies or stress granules yet. And then how does this cycle relate to the localization of mRNAs to certain regions of the cell and the biogenesis of mRNAs in the nucleus and their entry into the cytoplasm and uh, beginning to translate um, and function? And with that, I'd like to thank you all for your attention.